Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is Seek Sustainable Japan and a sub series that we do, try to do once a month called Short Takes 30 Minutes Talking About Sustainable Issues in Japan、uh, with me, JJ Walsh, here in Hiroshima. And hi, I'm Tova Kinooka in Yokohama. And Tova, you've just come back from a really exciting trip in Montreal for the young, One Young World. Tell us about it. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Joy. So,、um, yeah, still a bit jet lagged. So, if I'm a bit fuzzy,、um, that, that's why.、Um, so, the One Young World、uh, Summit happens every year in a different city around the world. It brings together about 2,000 young leaders.、Um, and this year it was in Montreal. And you can see here, this was a panel on sort of turning inspiration into action because the four days at the summit are really intense. We hear people talking about、um, projects they're doing all over the world on climate. On social issues,、um, on sort of activism,、um, governance, it absolutely blows your mind.、Um, David Suzuki, there, absolute,、um, you know, godfather of sustainability, he was amazing, did the keynote、um, and was talking a lot about the connection with nature and how we need to really connect and realize, you know, sort of. Re learn to be part of that、uh, very, very powerful speech.、Um, but yeah, these amazing young leaders.、Um, sort of, we had about I think 60, 65 in total from Japan, of which 18、um, are a group that we're working with from PWC Japan on sustainability intrapreneurship. So they all were sort of going, listening to the different sessions.、Um, Meeting people from all over the world that they would never ordinarily meet. It was incredible.、Um, and then now we're back, now we channel that into projects、um, which can make an impact, a、uh, positive impact on people and planet, but also sort of generate business for the company. So it's win 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 all round for that. So,、uh, yeah, always an inspiring event.、Uh, event. So that was,、uh, as always,、um, giving me a lot to think about.、Um, Renewed my motivation, I think, to, to come back and drive change from here. So,、uh, yeah, good stuff. Are you with us, Joy? Oh, okay, I'm, I'm back. I'm frozen you, for a bit. You're, you're back. Me, yep, we lost you for a moment. Uh, now, Tova, <laughs> you, you have done One Young World for quite a few years now. Can you just、yeah. talk about maybe some of the changes that you've seen over the years or trends that are developing、mm. or、uh, people、yep. that have done the program as, as youngsters and then now they're moving into leadership roles, for example?、Mm. Have you seen any Yes. Of that? Very much.、Um, and actually, there's a wonderful example right here in my water bottle.、I'm, we've talked about My Mizu many times. So,、um, Robin, one of the, the co founders of My Mizu, attended One Young World in 2015 in Bangkok.、Um, so, he's part of the alumni community and said that that was a real sort of pivotal moment for him, really inspiring him to want to, to come and make change. And we hear a lot of stories about that. And actually, the panel,、um, the、um, Picture you showed just earlier of the the two speakers, the lady in the green and the the young man in the suit.、Um, they were both sort of what we call returning ambassadors. So, yes, you can see there c a r o l from Colombia and、um, uh, Ramesh, I think,、um, who's from the UK.、Um, and they were both. In corporates,、um, went to One Young World several years back,、um, sent by their companies, and then went back and really started to, to drive change from within.、Um, so it was really inspiring to hear about. And then Carol has actually since then、um, left the corporate and set up her own organization.、Um, and so there were lots of examples of that who. Uh, of people who have really sort of taken this inspiration and then channeled it into action. And that's really, I think, what we want to see because, yes, it's all very well to go to these very inspiring events. And there's always a danger that there can be a bit of a talk fest, right? So you hear amazing things and all wonderful. And then if you come back and carry on with what you were doing before, then, you know, really, what's the point on that? So it was really inspiring to see a lot of people who'd sort of come, met people, got inspired. Had a sort of a, a complete rethink on what they were doing、um, and either starting up their own initiatives or driving change from within their companies as entrepreneurs,、um, like we're doing with the PWC、um, delegates, which 
is really powerful, right? These these companies have got such incredible resources um, and reach and scope to actually have positive impact. If you can get people from within driving that in the direction and, and sort of directing it at the big issues outside, then that can really make an impact. It's so important. And the mm. mentorship, uh, not only the leaders now, but uh, creating the leaders of the future, that kind of yes. thing, right? Yeah, um, yeah. If you wanted to get involved with One Young World, is it pretty easy just to go to the website and learn how to sign up for future events yeah. or training? Yeah, absolutely. So um, every year there's the summit. So the next one will be in Munich next year at the beginning of November. Um, so... A lot of people go as sort of sponsored by companies. So you can ask your company, say, look, I want to go to this and, and ask them to sponsor to send you. And it's for the 18 to 30 age range. Um, but also a lot of organizations sponsor scholarships. So if you're sort of an uh, entrepreneur, say, doing your own thing and you don't have the, the funding to get there yourself, there are all these scholarships you can apply for. And a lot of the people we heard from, a lot of the speakers were there um, on these scholarships and they're, they're aiming each year to increase the number of people there on scholarships so they can really give everyone access to this. Um, and so, yes, go and have a look at the website and all the information is on there. That's wonderful. And I, I put the link in the sh in the notes here and we'll put them in the show notes below. So people watching replays can also go there. Uh, thank wonderful. you for all your great work. And we'll talk about your amazing uh, insights from the Montreal food markets. Ooh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, one of the topics I, I had the chance on my show to interview Dr. Donna Weeks, uh, she spent a lot of time, many years uh, working in Tokyo, teaching political science. Uh, she is has been focused for many years on elections. And this is a big deal in Japan yes. today is the big LT, LDP uh, election within the party. So it's it's not a public election, but they will be choosing the president of the party. And because they're the most powerful party, it will likely be the next prime minister, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have, yeah. it looks like um, when I talked to Donna, Dr. Donna Weeks, we uh, had seven, like a short list of seven. But really this week we've we've noticed from all the various media, it really looks like three, okay. three candidates. Uh, so we have uh, Shinjiro Koizumi, mm -hmm. and he would be the youngest candidate at 43 years old. Of course, his father... Uh, was a pri very popular prime minister. Uh, Shinjiro Koizumi is now the environmental minister. Um, and when he had a child, he was the first government official to take paternity leave. Yes. He also supports yeah. the idea of keeping your own name, which is a big deal in uh, politics right now. Uh, should we force people to change their name or, or can they keep their own name, right? Mm -hmm. Especially for a lot of working women, this has always been an issue. Yeah. Uh, if you publish or you have a career before you get married and, and your name is known, it's like your brand, and then you get married, you're forced to change your name. It's mm. like you have to start over. Have you you met women, women like that in general? Yeah, very much, very much. So it's, yeah, I know it's an issue everywhere not just in Japan but I think in Japan it's particularly because it's tied to the Koseki um, right the sort of family register and stuff it, it's very very difficult um, and yeah I think very frustrating not to have a choice so it would be good to see that change yeah um, mm. Koizumi is also uh, he has a lot of policies to decrease uh, the wage gap uh, make uh, more flexible work experiences, uh, which has had a bit of pushback from more conservative people in the government, but it seems like a necessary change. So a lot mm -hmm. of things about changing the status quo of how businesses operate uh, supports more flexible labor market, um, very po popular. He's very popular with the business uh, lobby. So people who mm -hmm. run businesses, and also a lot of people are saying because he will be like the leader for the LDP, it will appeal to a lot more younger people uh, when the LDP has to fight for re-election. Right. Mm, so right. He, yep. he seems like he has a very uh, good chance. He's anti-nuclear power. 
but recently has uh, softened to say we need to use all types of energy. Mm -hmm. So not exactly sure. Uh, he is supporting of a carbon tax, uh, but in terms of uh, Japanese exports will have trouble if Japan doesn't have a carbon tax. Now yeah. in, in all of your, your consulting and work, have you come across any issues with carbon tax? In other countries or Japan? Um, it's something I think that companies are starting to become more aware of. Um, and our, sort of one project we worked on a few years ago, actually, with a, a Japanese uh, coffee company, um, we were having to really um, sort of help them understand that, okay, it might not be a, a sort of a big topic right here in Japan yet, but it's coming down the line. So if you can get ahead of that um, and lower emissions now on what you're doing um, and put sort of plans in place to lower over time, then you're not going to suddenly get whacked with a massive carbon tax when things do come in um, to sort of mandatory um, level in a few years time because it's coming. So I think there's a building awareness of this. Um, and so it's good to see things, you know, sort of that being talked about more. Um, but yeah, definitely it's, it's coming, right? So Japan's going to have to get with it. And then that idea, mm. which I really like that he's linking the idea, listen, environmental policy, it's very connected to our economic policy. Yeah. It's very mm -hmm. connected to our societal policy. So the idea of people, planet, profit and balance, right? Like we're really, he, he seems to get that idea. Mm. Yeah. Um, one of the criticisms of him is whether he has the the real know-how or the expertise because he's mm. a bit of a younger um, yeah. official. But I like that he's also, you know, very pro renewable energy. Uh, he wants to work on eliminating plastics. So there's a lot of environmental policy. In yeah, his, yeah, in that's his good to see. There. Mm -hmm. um, the next of the top three candidates is a veteran. Uh, Shigeru Ishiba. Uh, now, Ishiba is originally from Totori, a former mm -hmm. banker. Uh, mm -hmm. He is promoting more geothermal energy in Japan. That's interesting. And definitely has potential mm. for it with all the Huge onsen potential. hot springs, right? Um, yeah. He also wants to go down to zero for nuclear power, which is quite a radical stance mm. in, in terms of what's normally... Um, the top government is saying. Uh, he also supports Taiwan democracy. Uh, he wants to create a disaster agency in hmm. terms of Japan having so many natural disasters. There is no standalone disaster agency yet, and that's one of right. his policies, mm. which mm. seems like a good idea. That does, definitely. Um, he also wants to make an Asian country version of NATO to have more alliances and collaboration. Uh, with other countries in Asia. Uh, yeah. He also wants to get more businesses, support more businesses to get out of Tokyo and Ooh. go back to the regional areas. That would be good. <laughs> that would be good to see. Now, yeah. Ishiba yeah. is very popular with the public. When they do public polls, he's very popular. But within the party, he has less backing um, but hmm. it'll be very interesting who gets elected today don't you think yeah yeah now there's the one three yeah, yeah yes you have no idea now this is I, i've been way in the bubble <laughs> it's, a, it's a woman yes it's Sanae Takaichi. Now, this is kind of the first time yeah. that a woman candidate has really been one of the top candidates for the the presidential election for the LDP. Um, Sanai is a big fan and actually wrote a book about Margaret Thatcher. So she is mm. quite conservative. Uh, <laughs> she has uh, quite conservative views. She's against same-sex marriage. Uh, Ishiba mm. and Kozumi are supporting same-sex marriage mm. regulation. Now it's not part of Japanese law to allow mm. same-sex marriage. Um, the other two candidates support it. She's against it. She's okay. also mm -hmm. against keeping your name after marriage. Uh, so definitely more of the conservative mm -hmm. side of the mm -hmm. party. Um, she is really focused on the economy and uh, cyber security and uh, security of Japan in terms of intelligence and confidential information. Um, she also wants to keep interest rates low to encourage spending. 
where the other candidates are talking about bringing interest rates down, bringing cost of living down. So the the stance is, is very different, but yeah. she has a lot of support within the party. Mm. So she potentially could be the next prime minister. And Interesting. it's kind of exciting to see a woman in yeah. the top three. <laughs> it is exciting, but I, I'm I'm just looking at the comments here, and <laughs> Natasha, your your comments. I, I'm definitely with you on that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I would be rather concerned. I think it would almost feel like a step backwards in terms of yes. many of the yes, yeah, stuff. Exactly. So we we so. want to see representation. Mm. That's fantastic that she has support yeah. in the party, um, but you know she's kind of promoting uh, future tech in terms of energy, like let's create smaller nuclear power, whereas the other two are like, listen, we've we've tried nuclear for a long yeah. time. It's, it's mm. not really something that's working in Japan. Let's yeah. do other mm. uh, renewable energies that have proven success, you know? Mm. And I, yeah. I think this is definitely an, an issue to keep an eye on, but you know. Mm. We will find out by We tomorrow. will find out, yes. <laughs> okay, out. watch this face. <laughs> All right, let's go back to your Montreal markets. Tell us about it. Oh, this was just absolute heaven. So we arrived in Montreal for the, the summit um, a couple of days early just to get over the debt lag and then uh, went to the food markets, uh, the Marche uh, Jean Talon um, in Montreal, which was absolute heaven. As you can see, just loads and loads of fresh fruit and veg and no plastic. That was the really wonderful thing. So all the, the local people were just coming and, you know, they'd bring their, their bags, their shop um, baskets or whatever, and and just it goes straight into that so no need for any plastic um, there were also little stalls around where you could go and um, sort of sit and eat as well um, I had a wonderful galette um, there which was really really good so it was really nice to see it was a real sort of community hub yes there were a lot of visitors like us as well sort of coming in to look at it amazing range of fruit and veg i mean look at the brussels sprouts there on on the big stick um and artichokes and things absolutely incredible um and so we bought a whole load of fresh stuff there um which kept us going all week so each evening we'd come back after the summit if we had the munchies we'd just dive into the fridge and sort of mini carrots or uh, sort of peppers and things and the hummus and it was oh, just wonderful um but it was just yeah really nice to see um there's so much available um the fresh fruit and veg there um the lack of plastic was a wonderful thing to see but also the fact that it just made this wonderful sort of community hub and people obviously had their sort of regular person um you could see sort of when we were there looking at all the different stands somebody come up and say oh hello you know sort of greeting each other by name and their usual kind of um things going on so that was really nice to see sort of that it was bringing people together as well so much more personal than just going into a supermarket that's so good. And like all the pictures show, not only uh, no plastic, but the sheer variety yeah. of items available yeah. is just stunning. <laughs> yeah, oh my it was gosh. astounding. It was complete heaven. I mean, I, yeah, we could have bought so much more, but a lot of the time we were out and about, so uh, we couldn't get too much. But uh, yeah. Uh, my partner did a project uh, with a chef from Kyoto and uh, trying out different vegan food. And he, the chef was saying, well, you know, if you get good vegetable ingredients, of course, you can make high quality, high value, delicious and satisfying mm. vegan yeah. food. It's all about the good ingredients. Yes. Um, but sometimes you go in supermarkets in Japan, you're like, there's just like the same six vegetables that you can get most yeah. of the time um but then when i order from organic farms directly the subscription boxes that i order mm. sometimes i get the weird vegetables and i'm like what is this how do i cook it am i yes. gonna like it like you got the you yeah. got the hurdle that i have no idea but yeah. you want you need the diversity and the seasonality exactly. of things yes right yeah. is also now, really that's what important. makes it interesting right um and i think we we've got away from that a lot we were so used to having everything available all the time and japan has such wonderful seasonal fruit and veg it's yeah it would be great to get back to more of that i think and rather rather than forcing the seasons as well and sort of with all the the indoor farming which of course is very intensive um on sort of water and energy and things like this it'd be great to sort of go back to a more natural rhythm um and people 
get used to doing with that again. Yeah, absolutely. Now mm. that connects uh, to my next topic. Uh, I had gone to the Ogasawara Islands earlier this year. And Ogasawara Islands is actually a place that grows, um, maybe like Okinawa as well, grows winter vegetables like cabbage mm. and pumpkin all year so that people can get it uh, during the winter in other parts of Japan. So hmm. uh, that was one interesting thing I learned while I was there. Oh, um, wow. But but this article that just came out is about uh, the dolphin identification program. Hmm. So they're not uh, ta actually fi physically tagging uh, the dolphins, but they're spending time assessing how the dolphins look uh, in terms of scratches or the shape of the dolphin, and then mm -hmm. uh, documenting all of that information, uh, sharing that with uh, other whale watching companies or dolphin swimming companies, which uh, we talked to some of those stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of protection through documentation uh, was really interesting. And yeah. uh, Ogasawara Islands, again, one of the things that really impressed me was it was the first place in Japan and maybe one of the only places, unfortunately still, uh, which stopped whale hunting and <laughs> changed to whale watching. Yeah. Uh, so the idea is really about uh, protecting the animals, uh, protecting the nature reserve. They have really interesting insects and stuff. And part of that is documentation, but also sharing information amongst stakeholders, uh, people yes. who run tourism companies, uh, visitors themselves can also mm -hmm. take pictures and share in the database. Uh, so that's a that was a great uh, project to learn more about. That's lovely. I, I like the idea of visitors being able to sort of contribute to the data as well. That's uh, great to get people engaged. Now it looks like I I'm frozen. No, no, I'm back. Yep, you're back I'm again. Back. You're back again. Uh, good, good. Uh, now, Tova, you also had information about an event, Building Resilience at Conrad Tokyo. So this is, it's not an event. So this is a workshop that we did for Conrad um, about a, a just, three weeks ago now and we're going to be doing two more um for them so we we got all the leaders together um across the organization and this came from the the gm um neil mckinnis there who i was really impressed that he was prepared to put um time and effort and money into um creating space for his people to talk about mental health and stress and resilience. Because I think it's something we've seen a lot of companies talking about. We've seen a lot of stuff in the media about, you know, how uh, particularly since COVID and the pressures and, and the changes in sort of work and um, the way we work have really been impacting people's mental health. Um, and Neil was uh, sort of progressive enough to say, right, well, we need to do something on this. So we sat down together and designed this program um, on uh, sort of understanding stress um, for yourself, but also as a leader and, and how you can recognize um, when your people are under stress and then how you can build resilience as an individual to, to cope better with it, but also as a leader, how to create um, an environment around you for your people that is less stressful in the first place, but also to build resilience into the culture of the organization. So we, we it was a, a pilot session um, for all the, the leaders across the um, the hotel. And then uh, the next month and the month in January, we're doing uh, the same thing for the supervisor level. So it's sort of rolling it down to the next level, sort of 87 people across there, so that then they can roll that out to their team. So it was really great to see a company um, sort of taking the, the time to do that. And the response from the participants and the feedback that we got was they were so happy to just have the the time and the permission to be able to talk about this um, it's something you know everyone's dealing with and particularly as leaders they see their people getting stressed and they're kind of stuck between the orders coming down from above and the pressure to hit targets but then they see people you know struggling to cope with that um, so I think it was very liberating for people to be able to say no this we're not okay and what do we do about that um, so really impressed with Conrad um, sort of pioneering something like that that's great. That's great to hear. Uh, we need more support. Uh, how do we move forward, right? Yeah. Not not yeah. just the speeches and the ideas 
the ideas are fantastic. We need those mm. too, but we need more practical steps and yes. actual case studies and mm -hmm. benchmarking, right? All these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very Did much so. Did any, any interesting, like, especially for Japan challenges come up in these sessions? So, um, I mean, several things. So as with many other places, um, there's still a lot of stigma around sort of actually saying I'm struggling with this. And there's a lot of sort of pressure to gammon and just sort of put your head down and cope with it and, and not complain. Um, so it was great to see people sort of saying, well, actually, no, that's that's not healthy. We need to um, sort of create an environment where people can say, actually, I'm not all right and I need help. Um, we talked a lot about the whole sort of digital thing as well and um, creating boundaries around that and communicating those boundaries to the people around you. Um, because I think since sort of everything has become so digitalized, we're all on um, sort of uh, social media the whole time. And it was interesting in the, the hotel industry, um, they were saying that, for example, you know, the, the kitchens group or the, um, the sort of the rooms group, they all have their uh, sort of WhatsApp or line groups so they can communicate quickly with each other. But that means that when they're off their shift, they're still getting notifications on that. So it's really, really hard to switch off. Um, and when they see something come up, even though they're off, um, you know, and technically don't need to respond, there's that still that sort of pressure of thinking, oh, well, you know, should I step in and help? Or um, it, it's still there. So it's very, very hard for people to actually um, to step away properly from work. So we talked a lot about practical measures they could take as managers to, to put boundaries around that um, and to model that behavior so that people um, that they're in their teams can see that it's okay to actually shut that off and, um, and to say, no, from this time to this time, I'm not available, I'm off. Um, so sort of looking at healthier practices like that. And that's so important. Um, I, I often read about news articles around the world, not just in Japan, uh, mm. where people are reserving the right as employees of a business to not check their messages, to not check yeah. their phone once it's mm -hmm. after hours. And even making that kind of step and, and rule or allowance for yeah. the staff not to have to reply to mm. things after hours, that could be a really big step to really yeah. free people up to have more work-life balance, right? Very much. And I, I believe France has got legislation around this that you you uh, don't have to, you know, it's actually law that you are um, don't have to respond to uh, work sort of emails and things out of hours, which um, is very progressive. I think it would be great to see something like that coming in here as well, because I think it is a real challenge for people. Now we're also connected all the time. That's wonderful in many ways, but it's also a huge challenge in terms of actually switching off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when I do guided tours around, we pass by the castle. And if it's 12 noon, we always hear this beautiful koto music and taiko drumming to remind you that it's 12 noon. And they do it at 9, 12 and 5. And the guests always ask, why do they do that? And I say, well, it's a beautiful reminder to have a work-life balance. You know, yes. <laughs> time to so, go to work, time to yeah. take a break time to finish working and yes. then uh quite often people will say oh man we need that like yeah. we need that yeah. in our lives too and i think it's a great True. reminder that we should yeah. all try to have those times of day where we take breaks and we actually finish working that's yeah. a great reminder right <laughs> yes no no it's such a good good system i think if <laughs> we could do with more of that now mm. there was uh one more talk i wanted to mention that i did this month uh, with the amazing Emmy Kaiwa. Now she works for uh, Global Sustainable Tourism Council and she has worked all over the world. She was doing eco tours in Africa. Uh, she did her master's in business and tourism in Bangkok. Uh, she wow. did projects in Italy. So she really has a great global perspective. Now she's back working in Tokyo. Um, but really trying to help the tourism industry in Japan understand how they can change where they are. And mm. this is one of the great parts of the discussion is talking about not just looking at other countries and saying, oh, we have to be here, but right. looking at what you're already doing well. Mm -hmm. And let's just 
tweak that a little bit, improve on that, build on that strength. Like you don't have to completely wipe out everything you're doing because you're doing so much good, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and that was just a great part of the conversation. Fantastic. No, I think that's really empowering, right? So otherwise it can be feel like there's a lot of pressure to sort of do what they're doing and look outside, but actually looking in first and saying, well, what are we already doing? Um, can I think really help build confidence and, and momentum for for doing more. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. So they're doing a lot of education and training, uh, a lot hmm. of similar things you're doing with business. And hmm. I'm sure you, yeah. you have a similar philosophy, right? Not Very just much. go in and be like, you're doing everything wrong. Stop yeah. doing what you're doing. No, you know, this <laughs> Guaranteed is what you're doing. To balls yeah. up if you do that. <laughs> exactly. Like, don't give up. Don't give up. Yeah. Don't be overwhelmed, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Start where you are. I love that. Yeah, exactly. Well, on that note, start where you are and have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much, Natasha, once again, for joining us live. We love your comments. And uh, <laughs> thanks to everyone. And we'll see you again next month. Thank you, Tova. Wonderful. Thanks, Joy.